Super duper. Um, I noticed that um, Deepak couldn't remember my name, so I've done a very bad job. Uh, he had to look at the screen to find out who I was. Uh, I'll be working on that from now on. <laughs> Thank you very much for the hint. As he said, I'm going to be talking about uh, how to help Google make sense of a chaotic, unstructured web. The hashtag is my podcast. A little bit of self-promotion there. Um, what I think a lot of us fail to realize is that the web is incredibly chaotic. We kind of look at it, and as human beings, we make sense of it pretty easily. Um, and we don't realize how much of a problem it is for Google, especially in what Google is now trying to do. Um, I've just realized, having stood up here, that I don't have the thing to change the slides. So I'm currently feeling very stupid. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, and I don't know what... Oh, there you go. That must be it. Right. A friend of mine told me, do everything in threes. He's a teacher. He teaches people in the north of England, and he says, if everything is in threes, it always comes across and they remember it. Um, if you have two, you invent a third one, just to make sure that the point comes across. I had understanding and credibility, I added relevancy. So what does this mean? It's saying that what we're looking for is to be relevant for whatever the person is looking for. We need to be relevant to the searcher. We need Google to understand that we have the answer. And then we need credibility to convince Google that we are the answer it wants to show to its users. And that's another thing we often forget is we're not talking about any old people. We're talking about Google's users, Google's customers, and we're asking Google to recommend us and provide our answer as the answer. So today we're going to be concentrating on understanding. I kind of went a little bit off track there. Understanding. How do we make or encourage or help Google to understand what it is we're offering? That little icon at the top is a bit of design that I did myself. You can probably tell. Um, it's supposed to be a knowledge graph. Uh, and for anybody who doesn't know what a knowledge graph is, don't worry, I'm about to explain it. This is the World Wide Web, helping Google understand why knowledge graphs, they're the hub of answer engines. We've moved away from search engines, we're now looking at answer engines. Google wants to give the answer to the question. It doesn't want to give a choice. It wants the user to get the answer as quickly as possible so that they can mo then move on and look for something else and use Google again and keep generating revenue for Google. They've become, in my opinion, the hub of answer engines. It is the single most important thing to think about today. And we'll see Dave Davis, who isn't the guitarist from the Kinks, who is actually an SEO expert, who's really, 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 really smart guy. Here's a simple example. Not Dave Davis yet. That was a little teaser for you to get you excited. Kate knows Mary. Mary likes Pete. Mary, age 32. Pete, brother of Kate. Pete, born on. 27, 03, 1982. What is that? It is people with relationships to either other people or things, information about themselves, such as their date of birth or their age. There's a nice representation of it. Makes sense. All of a sudden, what we're seeing is what we call in graph theory, nodes with relationships. In knowledge graphs, entities with relationships to other entities. What is an entity? We're about to find out. Very, very complicated explanation. Don't worry about it too much right now. You'll be able to see the slides afterwards. You can probably watch the video again afterwards. And you can read that in your own good time. And you can go and look up Fluffy McCoy. Uh, love her name. Just for that, she's worth following. Dave Davis, here we go. Entities are the single most important concept to understand in SEO right now. Brilliant. Full stop. That's it. You can forget the rest. Well, not quite, but you know what I mean. This is your top priority from today, other than building your own brand. Sorry, Deepak. <laughs> so you're going to go away with, I think, seven or eight top priorities today. This is the one you should remember. Knowledge graphs. Entities, i.e. you, sir, with the beard. Me, our relationship. My relationship to the town I was born in. My relationship to the town I live in my relationship to Digital Olympus. I am Jason Barnard, speaks at Digital Olympus. Entity, me, Digital Olympus, well, Digital Olympus, another entity, relationship, speaks at. Attributes, my age, my height, um, where I was born, whatever it might be, and the relationships between these things. What I like 
is we've got ear. And it's really rubbish. I thought of that this morning. <laughs> and it's completely rubbish. So you can forget ear, but you do remember entities, attributes, relationships. Right. We know that an entity is defined by Google as a thing or concept that is singular, unique, well-defined, and distinguishable. Me. I'm unique, as my mother always told me. Well-defined, distinguishable, distinguished as well. It's important to understand that it's not just people. It's not just places. It's things like colour. It's concepts. Colour, money, price, tax. So don't just think of a knowledge graph as people with relationships or places with relationships to people. It's also colours. My t-shirt is an entity. It has a colour that is red, which is another entity. You've all seen this, I'm sure. Strings to things doesn't really mean very much until you think strings. What were Google doing? They were analysing character strings. Now they're thinking in terms of objects, entities. Saying, I want to understand the world. So you can take away from this first part with a little bit complicated, maybe. Google wants to understand the world. It understands the world using a knowledge graph. A knowledge graph is a kind of encyclopedia for machines. Make sense? Hope so. The problem is how to build it. Manual curation, curation sorry, crowdsourcing. Easy. It reads Wikipedia, it gets facts. It looks in Wikidata, it gets facts. It looks in IMDB, which is the movie database. It gets facts. It gets all this information, no problem. But human beings have had to build that. And that isn't scalable. Google cannot understand the world if it's asking you and you and you and you to check this information. This lady here was working at uh, Google. Now she's at Amazon. Everybody's at it. But she started this idea of uh, extracting data from the unstructured web. And we're going to move forward reasonably quickly because I want to get to the handy hints that will help you move forward. If we look at this, the, the, the top right-hand corner, head knowledge, a bit like a head keyword. Head knowledge is the stuff that we have that has been curated by humans, that human beings have checked. It's been fact-checked, very important. We have an enormous amount of grey stuff that we have no, or Google has no access to. It can't get the information because it cannot scale this human validation. So understanding that problem is key to helping them solve it. As with everything, understanding the, what, what, where the problem lies gives the key to the solution. This is the really, really, really exciting bit where I give you handy hints, tips, and tricks. She talks about Google extracting unstructured data, i.e. data or content that Google cannot fact check for itself easily through text, DOM, tables, and annotations. Doesn't mean anything to you, I'm sure, or to some of you. Some of you it does, I know, looking at Hannah Thorpe. What she wants to do, what she was trying to do at Google, what she's now doing at Amazon, is be able to extract this information, the grey areas, as validated facts without human intervention. So the computer, Google, the machine, is going to extract data and verify and check whether it is true or not, and insert it into the knowledge graph, so that Google can then work on the idea of strings, not things, i.e. looking at understanding the world to return the answer that you want to your query and not relying on comparing chains of characters. And over time, if it can do it successfully, we will build up. And if you're asking, if you're, sorry, if you're wondering what the dark green and light green is, it's dark green is fact, light green is probable. And the idea is that we'll build over time and get more and more facts in this grey area around it. And that is scalable, so Google will be able to understand the world in a semi-human manner, perhaps even in a human manner, perhaps in a superhuman manner, because a machine is always going to remember everything, whereas we always forget, or I do anyway. Right, so we've got four aspects, and I'm sorry my friend told me three, and Xin Luna Dong has completely ruined the presentation by giving me four, and I haven't got a choice, I have to do the four. How can we best leverage schema? Who knows what schema is? Oh, that's a brilliant start. OK, I'm, we're going to have four questions as well. Right, schema markup. Have you ever thought about it like that? 
Who are you and what do you do? This is going to help Deepak, so we're helping each other out here, mate. Using schema to confirm what Google has probably already understood on your site, you've explained who you are and what you do, I would imagine. What you then do is use schema markup to confirm to Google that it has correctly understood. So I like to say, I mean, this is rubbish science, but it's going from 40% confidence in what it's understood to 60% because you've confirmed it. If you then go out and get other people to confirm it, it's like NAPS in local search. Who knows NAPS in local search? Name, address, phone number, thank you very much. Consistency, confirmation. If you can get that going, you will end up with something that Google is 80%, 90% sure it's understood, perhaps 100. In which case, Google will be terribly confident in presenting that information to its users as a fact, which is what it's aiming to do. And if you've seen the featured snippets at the top of the results, for Google, in its mind, those are facts. They're things it can rely on. They come from the knowledge graph. That's very important to remember if you're looking to get featured snippets, which Fernando was talking about earlier on. Little example, one of my clients, a bit of advertising there for them. Lucky them. Um, very simple. We all start with the About Us page, and we say, this is who I am, this is what I do. This is in French, by the way. But in fact, every single page on your website could contain schema markup, should contain schema markup. David Jader was on a webinar series with me last year. He said, when you rebuild your web website, start with the schema markup. Because it will help you understand what each page is communicating, what you're trying to say, and it will help you with the categorization, the structure of your website, and it will mean that you are presenting pre-digested information to Google so that Google can say, okay, great, got this page of content, think I've understood it, that's just confirmed it, I'm away, that's a fact. Or I'm confident that it's true. If you look up the hashtag SEO is AEO, pretty much any subject that I mention in this talk, you add that behind it, you will come up with a result like that. It will be a podcast episode or a webinar with some of the people I'm going to mention coming on, because I'm going to give you the people you should be following if you're interested in these topics. Please do take a picture of this screen. If you're interested in schema markup, these three are brilliant. Well worth following, well worth listening to, very, very smart people specialise in schema markup, which I'm not. Tables and lists. We all think tables and lists are really simple, but they're not. How can we best leverage them? This is a really simple, we've all seen this. What I love about it is that tables and lists are very old HTML. It's stuff we were doing in 1998. I'm older than I look. Coming back into fashion now, Google needs this. It needs it because it's structured, because it can rely on what the fact that, sorry, that we've got columns, we've got rows, we've got a caption. It can rely that that information plays a specific role. And we'll talk about playing roles or the roles that content plays within the content later on. The other thing very important to know here is one of the biggest problems Google has had is 95% of tables are used for design by people and not for data. So it had to develop a system to throw the design to one side because it wasn't structured data, it was simply design elements. So if you have tables on your site which are for design, change them to divs. Divs are there for design. Tables are there for presenting data. Another little handy hint, if you've got a table, describe it in text underneath. Why? Two reasons. Some people don't like reading tables. They like to be given the conclusions of that table. The other is that it confirms to Google that it is understood. And it gives it also a choice of the way it wants to present that data to its users. So potentially, you can have a table in one set of results and the text in another. This is really cool, too. It's actually uh, exploring the data accepted by Google. It's an experimental table search engine. And you can type in a term, and it will pull out the tabular data that it has for that term. I gave an example here of a, uh, a conference I'll be doing in a few weeks. It all, that, sorry, as a site owner, you can then check that Google has digested, understood, and is confident it is understood what you have in your tables. And of course, your design-based tables will not get in here. Two people to follow for that. Arnout is a big fan of that search engine I just showed you. Bill Slowski, 
if anybody knows him. If you don't follow him, he's super duper smart and he knows about all this stuff. He gets a couple of mentions, but obviously I can't put him on every slide. DOM extraction. You all know what a DOM is, I hope. Put your hand up if you don't. Great. One person doesn't. It's the HTML. It's the, the, the tags, the divs, and all that stuff. Good. DOM digestion. I was talking to Alex yesterday about this. I like the idea of Google going out, getting its food, collecting the food, when food is um, supposed to be data content, gets that food, takes it in, swallows it, digests it. So we're looking for DOM digestion, which is a kind of cool phrase I thought I would uh, share with you today. Consistency is the most important thing. What is Google's biggest problem? It's rubbish HTML. It's people who write different structured HTML pages for different parts of their site, or they hand code it, which is what I do, uh, and it all goes horribly wrong because I'm not consistent. Human beings are not consistent. We're rubbish at it, and Google is very, very reliant. Ooh. I'll give you some time to turn that down, thank you. Google is very reliant on consistency. Why am I showing you this? Because Wikipedia is incredibly structured. Every single page is structured the same way. So Google can read it and it can rely on the fact that it's understood what role each piece of content is playing. Amazon, it crawls Amazon and it has had to understand how Amazon structures its pages because it needs that information. Yelp is the same thing. You aren't in that position. Your site is tiny. Google isn't going to spend any effort at all trying to figure out what your rubbish page structure is. So you need semantic HTML5. I won't explain this in detail, but basically all we're doing is saying, this is the header, navigation. At the bottom, we've got the footer, not very important. On this side, we've got an aside, which means it's not central to the content. And in the middle, we've got the article. That's the important content. The role that that plays in this page is the principal content that you should be concentrating on. The role that the footer plays is being the footer. The navigation has a role. So the idea is to say, this part of the page has this role, so you can treat it in a specific way. So I would advise, there are articles all over the place here uh, on this topic. I wrote one, this, this is another piece of design that I did. Um, I'm not very good, and I've got a pretty bad taste in colour. Oh, sorry, one very important thing here, talking about colour, is you'll notice that the orange squares do not correspond to the semantic HTML5. That is because the orange squares are design, and this is semantic, giving a role to each piece of content. So every time you look at your page and the, the design and the semantic HTML5 are more or less the same or are the same, you've probably got it wrong. Because it is very rare that design and semantic roles that a piece of content plays in a page are the same. AMP and WordPress, why is that important? AMP is structured. It's very simple. It's very simplified HTML. Cindy Crum came up with an idea the other day that I love. It's worth building an AMP site, not just for speed, but also because Google hosts it. It is very structured, very simple, and it can map your HTML normal desktop content to the AMP content and be confident it's understood what content plays what role. The other reason I've put WordPress up here is because Google is now employing WordPress developers to help with the development of WordPress with the aim of making responsive design and PWAs. So what they're doing is they're saying, we're going to start structuring WordPress in much the same way that we have here. So anybody who's got a WordPress site, let's say three years time, four years time, if you stick to best practices as set out by Google WordPress developers, you will be in a situation where it will be able to read your content, understand your content, in a similar manner to this without you having to do that. So do that today. If you've got a WordPress site in three years' time, you probably won't need to do it anymore. Cindy Crum and Joost de Volk, Joost de Volk, sorry, both of them brilliant. One on AMP and Fraggles, which is HTML5. She's a big fan of all that. And Joost de Volk, obviously, big, big, big uh, expert on WordPress. 
last little section we're coming into the final stretch free text these are great words who knows what they all mean oh i didn't six months ago and then i talked to dawn anderson she explained it all to me writing copy here we go does anyone remember that from earlier on entity relationship entity that's what we do. Apple makes iPhones. Bananas are yellow. It's simple grammar. Very simple grammar. It's saying entity, relationship, entity. I keep saying it, but I can't say it enough. It's incredibly important. I'll let you take that photo. Not good. Why not? We have a phenomenal problem for a machine, is that the entity surrender, the relationship sells, and the entity shoes are terribly, terribly separated. There's lots of fluff in between. There's lots of useless words that are there to appeal to me as a human being. But the computer, the Google, finds it difficult to understand these parts of the text. When your texts are uh, set out like that, this is a really good example. I've said the same thing. I haven't thrown away my wonderful copywriting skills as you can see i've got the same information but i've put my entity my relationship and my second entity right next to each other google will be able to pull that out and be very confident it has understood that serenza sells shoes relatedness co-occurrence context clouds the idea here, if anybody's using synonyms today, stop. Synonyms are old hat. The idea here is to create a context cloud using co-occurrence and words that are related to each other within the context that you're using. For example, on the beach, these are words that tend to appear together. So Google would expect to see them in a page about a beach. If you then look at bay, for example, in this context, it's clear that it's a bay of water, but it could be a bay in a delivery situation where somebody is delivering with a lorry, a lorry bay. So the context words around that will be very different. It will be factory, it will be lorry, it will be drive, it will be unload. So the context gives meaning to the word bay and it knows what kind of bay we're talking about. And you would be very surprised, or you probably wouldn't be very surprised because you're all terribly clever how many words have multiple meanings and how confusing it can be and how much if you just look at this cloud the context becomes incredibly clear and all of those words mean something within that context june i've just seen that one i hadn't seen it earlier on it's a film in another context you would have the actors you would have um the the producer you would have the film studio and so on and so forth so it's Incredibly powerful, if you can use words of co-occurrence and relatedness, you will give the context and you will help Google understand which type of bay, which type of dune you are talking about. Once again, Bill Slowski, he reads patents, if nobody, if anybody, sorry, didn't know that. Uh, he reads the patents, they're really boring. Uh, and he writes articles that allows us to all just kind of read his articles and say, great, simple. Dawn Anderson, she was the one who told me about co-occurrence and relatedness. Great people. So the conclusion, the web as a database. If you think of the web as a da database, it helps you understand how Google is approaching this problem. It's the biggest knowledge graph ever, but it's very badly organized. And if you can help, if you can organize your little corner of the web, Google will thank you. And when Google thanks you, it sends you traffic. And that traffic presumably makes your money, or you wouldn't be here. Uh, what's ironic here is I got this phrase, this screenshot from Diffbot and not from Google. But it's a great way of presenting it. Google wants to turn the, the web into the biggest knowledge graph ever. Last is empathy for the machine. I'm a big fan of the word empathy today. Obviously, having empathy for a machine is not necessarily what we all want to do, but understanding what they're trying to do and what problems they're coming up against and what problems this machine has to overcome to understand what it is you're doing allows you to solve those problems for it or help solve those problems for it, make it happy so that it can 
send the traffic your way because it is understood that you are relevant, that you are credible, that you are the best answer, and you will satisfy Google's users. Thank you. If anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to ask, answer. From my knowledge graph that's up here in my head. No? I'm always disappointed when there aren't any questions. Yeah, ask me a question, ask me a question. What about, I mean, what about tools you would suggest for doing this entry search? Oh, you're Italian, yes? yes. Wordlift, great Italian company. Uh, they've got a plugin for WordPress which identifies or tries to identify as entities and relationships. And what they're saying is build your internal knowledge graph. And this is brilliant. I love these guys. And Gennaro Coafano, who was up there earlier on, uh, and a guy called Andrea Volpini, are the, the people behind this, they're saying build your own knowledge graph, entity, relationship, entity, and then you feed it to Google. And they help you to do that using their plugin. Absolutely brilliant. I tried it on my site, little story that I quite like. I wrote Jason Barnard, full stop, double bass, full stop. How stupid is that? I was saying to Google, I'm a double bass. And I meant to say Jason Barnard, double bass player, because I play the double bass. And what you realize with this kind of tool, with, with WordLift in particular, is how badly we express ourselves. WordLift has trouble getting a handle on it. I spent hours going through it trying to, trying to do it all, trying to link it all up, trying to link my entities with the right shit. Took me absolutely hours and I realized how rubbish my writing was, how silly some of the stuff sounded when you take it out of context. Brilliant tool. So if you've got a WordPress site, you're away with that. Thank you for the question. Makes me feel much happier. Thank you very much. Have a lovely afternoon.